Thank you so much for having me today. I was recently told a story by a physician, one that I respect and admire. This physician teaches medical student ethics, training new doctors in the United States. He asks his students to complete the following phrase. The road to hell is? Most of them cannot do it. It's only the rare individual who went to medical school in their 40s and 50s that immediately knows the second half. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Probably everyone in this room knows that it was the Democrats that paved the road that we are currently on. I am here to ask you to give us a chance to find our way back. Do not give up on us. We from the left have to be involved in this course correction. I'm here today to ask those of you who are conservative, who have been lifelong Republicans, to not give up on the Democratic Party. We provide a needed counterpoint and balance. Do not give up on us. And let me explain my own way back. I was raised in a family where we were most more likely to be watching the, the actual State of the Union address as a family, even as a small kid. I never watched a Super Bowl with my parents. I Just very different kind of family. I was raised to believe in the core principles of the Democratic Party, principles that I believed included my own willingness to sacrifice as an individual for the good of a larger society. I know that many of you could argue that those are not the values that the Democratic Party or the left is currently standing for today. I ask you not to give up on us. In college, I didn't become a lesbian. I already was a lesbian. <laughs> so instead, I became a radical. I actually found anarchism. I believed in anti-capitalist principles, anti-globalization principles. I read Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn, and Derek Jensen, who actually is one of the first, like, TERFs, which <laughs> I didn't realize at the time. I cut my teeth on the activism in this weird period. I graduated from high school in 1998. Does anyone in this room know what happened in 1999? Wow. The World Trade Organization protests in Seattle. What many of us on the left feel like was one of the highest points in our collective organization. We created broad coalitions and collective protests. I have been pepper sprayed, I have been hit with rubber bullets, and I have been arrested in this period. I went on to live in an anarchist collective. We actually dumpster dove to find food. We rode our bikes everywhere, and we had passionate political debates all night long. We also could not figure out who the hell was going to sweep the floor in the kitchen. <laughs> We couldn't agree if it should be a mandated activity because that would be forcing labor on another human being. We ended up with mice in our kitchen over the winter. So someone's great idea was actually to go to the Humane Society and adopt a cat and solved our mouse problem and no one ever ended up sweeping the floor. I want young people in this country to have experiences like this. Maybe not to the full extent like mine, but I hope that our children learn to question things when they're young. I want them to get out and explore the world. I want them to read books that shake their beliefs to their very core. I wish this for every single adolescent right now today. But I just wish that their bodies remain intact and whole as they do so. I remained firmly embedded in the extreme radical left for decades. I completed my undergraduate degree in cultural anthropology. I was actually studying abroad. I was in West Africa. I was in Ghana when 9-11 happened. My undergraduate thesis was titled Entry and Existence in a Countercultural Anarchist Collective. <laughs> My first real job as, after I graduated was a center manager at a Planned Parenthood. And 
that new job brought new perspectives. And it also was part of what I learned that the path to hell is paved with good intentions. I remember that there were transgender ideas percolating within these extreme radical spaces as far back as I can remember. I'm talking 1998, 1999. And part of this anarchist movement that I grew up with was within the punk music movement. And the thing about punk, which I know sometimes we compare you know, the gender kids to the goth kids to the punk kids, punk is not just music and clothes. Punk is a really inherently violent, angry, and male-dominated movement. It, it was grounded in a lot of anger. These are young people who are angry at society. I recognize that some of the origins of the gender discussions that we're having in this room actually started in the anarchist community, started with pushing back on some of these strict gender roles and ideas and these demands for gender conformity. So as we try to address these societal problems, I recognize that back then we were looking to figure out ways to change the culture. We never intended this to become about changing the body. So this is a poster that this is called Vintage now, by the way. This is from 2003. So I own one of these original posters. So this was created in the radical anarchist circles in the early 2000s. I'm going to read it so um, we can all kind of let these feelings sink in. So for every girl who is tired of acting weak when she is strong, there is a boy tired of appearing strong when he feels vulnerable. For every boy who is burdened with the constant expectation of knowing everything, there is a girl tired of people not trusting her intelligence. For every girl who is tired of being called oversensitive, there is a boy who fears to be gentle, to weep. For every boy for whom com competition is the only way to prove his masculinity, there is a girl who is called unfeminine when she competes. This is my favorite line. For every girl who throws away her Easy Bake Oven, there is a boy who wishes to find one. <laughs> For every boy struggling not to let advertising dictate his desires, there is a girl facing the ad industry's attack on her self-esteem. For every girl who takes a step towards her liberation, there is a boy who finds the way to freedom a little easier. We were actually trying to address these real issues, these real stereotypical constraints that we were feeling as young people growing up into becoming men and women. And these issues have been completely lost. So my first child was born in 2008, and by 2010, I was basically essentially out of the anarchist movement and into more mainstream left ideals. But I still believed and was willing to sacrifice for the betterment of society. Around the time when my oldest was two, I went to a gathering at our local anarchist bakery. <laughs> there is a Ronin joke in my family about this actual bakery because I had a former partner who worked there and I swear to you, at one point my dad worked there. <laughs> They did not always have enough money to pay their workers, which probably shouldn't surprise anyone. They're running an anarchist bakery. <laughs> However, um, they always had bread. They always had these gourmet, super expensive, amazing loaves of bread. One of the things that I'll never forget about my dad is he, I never saw him hand, hand a pan handler a dollar, never gave any money, but he would pack these like brown bag lunches in the car. And if somebody asked him for money, he would hand them a sandwich and an apple and a bottle of water. So at a certain point, he was handing out the most high-end gourmet loaves of bread out his window to panhandlers, like $10, $12 loaves of bread. So I went to this gathering, and there was this video shown of a protest that took place in some city far away, and cars were burning. And all of a sudden, I saw those scenes I saw protests that once meant to me a better end. I saw it now as terrifying. I was holding a two-year-old. How could a parent take care of a baby in a scene like that? And then the protests in Ferguson happened in my city. And a dear friend of mine from the anarchist movement was actually shot in those protests. But he was also armed. And he had gone to the streets 
with a gun. He had become an extremist. He had good intentions, but my city's burning, was burning down. And I, I tried to go visit him in the hospital, but I was denied entry because at that point he was in police custody. The road to hell is paved with good intentions and extremism in all of its forms is a pathway to hell. And I realized that extremism and the left do not have to be the same thing. Even my favorite band, which is called Against Me, they had, they had two songs, they had two songs a decade apart. In 2002, it was Baby, I'm an Anarchist, and in 2010, it was I Was a Teenage Anarchist. <laughs> the lyrics in their 2010 song included, do you remember when you were young and you wanted to set the world on fire? I do. But I also remember that the adults didn't let it happen. They stopped us from burning it all down and they also didn't let us inadvertently change our physical bodies. The adults in both parties have to start working together to keep these extremists at bay. Because if you get far enough to the left, you're gonna meet the far right. And that is why the center must hold. Don't give up on the Democratic Party, as much as I know it's so difficult to think of, but I wanna bring you now to that time when I began working with these young people who are HIV positive and then the young people who are identifying as transgender. Many of you are so familiar with this part of my story. I started working in the Gender Center in 2018, and I firmly believed that I was upholding the principles and values that I held true. I thought that I was going to be preventing suffering and distress in young people. I thought I was supporting my community and helping young people be themselves. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. We had good intentions, we just didn't have any context. We did not understand the history, we did not understand the Dutch studies. We didn't even look at their data. And these are not excuses. I am not asking you for forgiveness. Just maybe a little grace. We didn't know when we opened in 2017 what Tavistock knew in 2015. We didn't know that they had attempted to recreate the Dutch findings and it didn't happen. We didn't know what happened at GEMS. But when we started to know better, we needed to start doing better. We needed to step up and be the actual adults and the actual scientists and the actual hospital administrators and the actual lawyers and the actual journalists. We needed the medical editors in medical journals to step up and be the grown-ups in the room. We all needed to do better and we didn't. And we failed you. We failed you as parents. We failed you as patients. And we failed you because we were supposed to be the public servants. That is the left that I always knew. We were the public servants and we failed you. I knew better by about year two, but I just couldn't grasp the extent at that time. So I spent almost two more years trying to figure it out. I educated myself, I went back and read the studies, and I started to really listen to those outside of my bubble, and I started to face some really harsh realities. And then I did go back to those core values that I grew up with as a young person. I did go back to my roots. And I regained that strength to look at the authors who are willing to ask the questions. And honestly, on some level, I went back to that anarchist punk kid that I knew who was willing to question authority when authority is wrong. <laughs> so I did the only thing that I thought I could do. And in the period since I blew the whistle, I have experienced attacks from so many. The attacks leveled on me very quickly 
actually came from my own local Democratic newspaper. And the first story they ran was about the political party of my attorneys. It was not about the substance. It was not about the science. They didn't even publish things about the concerning cases. It was about the political party of my attorneys because they know, because the left knows that at the core, the substance of my whistleblow is rooted in the principles from the left. I spent hours with a reporter from the New York Times, and she kept asking me because she couldn't wrap her head around it. She kept saying, you must be a fundamentally different person. There must be an old Jamie and a new Jamie. And she even went so far as, she took a picture of the tattoo on my right leg, which is, <laughs> which is a very poor choice because young people make poor choices. <laughs> but it's an anarchy sign with a feminism Black Panther fist. Okay. Her hypothesis that there was an old Jamie and a new Jamie is incorrect because I am still of the left. I still uphold the core principles and values that I have always believed and whistleblowers at their core are willing to speak truth to power. They're willing to sacrifice their own personal safety and privacy to shed light on a harm. All of the whistleblowers from the gender industry that I know and respect also demonstrate the strength that it takes to acknowledge their own complicity in causing harm. And almost all of us are LGB and T. As Utah Phillips said, following the path of least resistance is what makes a river crooked. The path of least resistance right now is very appealing for the left to stay on regarding youth gender medicine. Because the hard path, the path that will follow the science, would be to admit that the experiment conducted at the start was flawed. It also requires us to admit that good intentions can easily get out of hand when they're not grounded in evidence. Which is why you're going to continue to see left media outlets painting this entire issue as right versus left. Which is why it is so much easier to say, well, Jamie must be being bankrolled by the right as if I've ever given a rat's ass about money. I was an anarchist, I ate out of a dumpster, and almost all of my clothes are still being offered for free on Craigslist. <laughs> Nobody wants to admit when they're wrong. It sucks, it is a shitty feeling, I know it. I was wrong, and my participation in the pediatric gender industry was wrong. And political parties get things wrong too. Remember the weapons of mass destruction? <laughs> Remember when we settled for Obamacare instead of the national health care system? Political parties change course, especially when it's on a specific issue, and especially when evidence comes to light to show that that specific issue is inherently in conflict with its core party values. But it requires those from within to be brave, to dig into those values and be willing to take risks. Okay, so I'm gonna show another thing up here. Don't, don't groan at me. I know where you're all gonna think. Okay. <laughs> so I know many of you know this sign. I don't think anyone in here is gonna be willing to put their hand up and say that it was in their yard. <laughs> but I ask you again, don't give up on the left. I know we have a really fine needle here to thread. But the left, that I know actually believes that science is real. The left that I know when they look at the scientific evidence regarding medically transitioning children and young people, they're gonna know that we cannot continue supporting these practices. We know that European nations are correct in their systematic reviews of the evidence. The left that I know does not cower in the face of bullies, which is why whistleblowers like me even exist. It's why Anna Hutchinson exists. It's why Rita Cattiello exists. And it's also why I'm speaking daily to a number of people through protected channels whose name you do not know currently, but I hope someday will. If you still work in a gender center and you need someone to talk to, I am here, we are here, 
the left that I know actually does believe in freedom of speech and is appalled at the current silencing of alternative views. The left that I know believes that women's rights are human rights. And the left that I know understands the basic fairness of women's sports. The left that I know believes in the right to safe shelters for those experiencing domestic violence. The left believes that lesbians and gay men have the right to places to be together in community. And the left believes that love is love and we will fight for the right for the L, G, B, and T to form relationships and families and uphold the right to marriage. I'm gonna end with a brief story. I will honestly say to the historians out there, I have no idea if it's true. <laughs> however, however, it both human, it humors me and crystallizes that good intentions are never enough. And I encourage you to borrow this story if you're willing to go home and talk to your lefty neighbor that might still have this yard sign up, okay. <laughs> so when the British invaded India, they found in the southern provinces specifically, that there was a huge number of poisonous snakes. So they began a program to give money to anyone who would bring a dead snake to a government office. Seems like a great idea, right? So people started bringing them dead cobras in droves. More cobras than the British could ever imagine even existed. It turns out that the populace had begun breeding cobras. <laughs> cobras had become an easy source of extra income. Once the British realized what they had done, they dropped the monetary incentive immediately and everyone released their breeding cobras <laughs> out into the wild. So the British ended up with way more poisonous snakes than they ever thought possible. The road to hell is not about snakes. <laughs> However, it is paved with good intentions. And I know that I am not alone and I'm asking you to help me thread this needle. Thank you.